Good morning, brothers and sisters. May I invite each one to have a moment of silence and we shall do the universal prayer in a short while. A moment of silence, please. Shall we all please stand up for the universal prayer? O oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee know he is also one with every other. Thank you. You may now take your seats. A pleasant morning. Brothers and sisters, we are on our fifth day of this International Convention of the Theosophical Society here in Varanasi, the spiritual capital of India. We continue under the theme, Nurturing the Divine Seed. And for this morning's session, we have two lectures under the interesting topics of living intelligently and the second lecture is the sublime symbology of the lotus. To introduce our first speaker, please allow me to approach it in an unorthodox way. Let me first introduce and acknowledge his wife, Pratibha, who is with us and who is also a theosophist. And they are blessed with a daughter, Shama. And I do acknowledge these individuals among others because I think they are the unheralded individuals who provide context, who provide the impetus the inspiration, the moral support, and the love and patience to our tireless theosophical workers and lecturers. Our first speaker was born in Nairobi. And uh, sometime in 1971, he obtained his degree in Bachelor of Science in chemistry and physics in Mumbai. Upon returning to Nairobi, he had a short stint as a professor teacher and then proceeded to establish his own company in the furnishing and interior designing business. He has now uh, retired after 35 years in the business and has uh, been a full-time theosophical worker but he became a theosophist in the uh, 
early age of 16 and by the age of, uh, by 1975, he was already assistant secretary of the Nairobi branch. When he turned 25 years old, he found himself as secretary and also with a daunting task of hosting the seventh World Congress of the International uh, Society. He has had uh, numerous tasks as Secretary General and in uh, 2005, he had the uh, unique opportunity and he was instrumental in bringing out the postal stamp on the Theosophical Order of Service to commemorate the centenary of Theosophy first coming in East Asia. This was a major achievement as this has been the first postal stamp ever issued outside India on a theosophical activity. Currently, uh, way back in 2015, he was elected Secretary General of the East and Central African section. So brothers and sisters, help me welcome Narendra Manekhansha with the uh, topic today, living intelligently. Brothers and sisters, According to the Big Bang Theory, perhaps the Divine Spirit descended down into matter almost 13.8 billion years ago. Subsequently, we have spent millions of years in the mineral, plant, and animal kingdom before evolving into the human kingdom. In the secret doctrine, Madam H.P. Blavatsky states that humanity develops through seven great evolutionary cycles called the root races, which gives rise to seven consecutive human civilizations. The first self-conscious humanity resembling what we know today was the third root race which started almost 18 million years ago. In our evolutionary journey through the mineral, plant, and animal kingdom, we were evolving as a group soul. We had no capacity to think or to concretely direct the evolutionary process. Nature was in control and the evolutionary process was slowly taking place, driven by nature. However, as we all know, in the human kingdom, we evolve individually, not as a group soul. We've been gifted with the capacity to think and make important and significant decisions and act accordingly. Therefore, as humans, we can be in control and for the first time, we can drive, the, drive forward the process of evolution. 
The question is, should we as humans and having the capacity to think hasten this evolutionary process? Why not let nature take its own time to grow and evolve? Why, why interfere with nature? Why take the trouble of hastening the evolutionary process? <clears throat> well, all religions and philosophies point out that left on its own, the divine seed will take millennia and millennia, basically a very, very, very long time to evolve and reach the goal. And what is this goal? The goal is of becoming perfect, that of merging back with the Creator, our Father in Heaven. The goal is of becoming one with Him. The goal is of letting the divine spark shine forth. The goal is of becoming consciously aware and feeling one with the divine spirit. And the clear understanding is that left on its own, we will need to take many, many incarnations, uncountable series of lives to reach perfection or to reach the goal. And how do we describe these many, many human lives that we have lived through so far and the many more we are expected to live before hopefully we reach perfection. To look at that, the series of lives that we have spent, let us briefly look at a typical day in our lives daily. It starts with preparing breakfast, driving the kids to school, rushing to work, chasing clients, solving customers' problems, sending emails and messages, organizing a meeting, handling a crisis, taking someone to the hospital, making a train booking, preparing for an interview, attending a parent's forum, buying provisions for the house, cooking a meal, squeezing time for the gym, paying respects to a friend's father who has passed away, buying a few items from the supermarket, cleaning the house, getting the laundry done, and scores of other errands and tasks. The list can be endless, and we go through this every day. At the end of the day, we fall dead on the bed or sofa, or what now is called sofa bed. Before we know, it is already the next day, the next morning, and it is even crazier than the day before. There is no time to reflect or to think about where we are heading to. 
majority of humanity is running around like a bunch of headless chicken. Well, the common feeling of majority of humanity is that our lives are full of trials and tribulations, full of strife and struggles, full of pain and misery, full of difficulties and hardship. Our lives are generally devoid of peace and happiness. It seems to be a meaningless rat race to nowhere. And why are our lives so difficult, so miserable, so full of struggle? Why is there no peace or happiness? This may be so because perhaps we are not looking where we are going. We are not thinking where all this is leading to. Perhaps we are looking for peace and happiness in the wrong place. For man, man a creation of nature who has the capacity to think, is that intelligent living? We feel having more wealth and more material possessions will give us happiness. But acquisition of any amount of wealth is not taking away our pain and misery. We feel having more power and position will give us peace, but acquisition of power is not taking away our trials and tribulations of life. Obviously, our experience tells us that no amount of wealth or possessions or position or power is giving us the peace and happiness we are looking for. None of this is making our lives less difficult. Ordinarily, we feel and think that satisfying the five senses will give us pleasure and joy in life. Experience tells us that satisfying the five senses may give us momentary pleasure or happiness, but it is temporary and soon the pleasure wears off and one is left craving for more sensory satisfaction. It is like a bottomless pit or a black hole. It needs more and more. There is no end to it, and this makes us more and more miserable. Is that intelligent living? Well, what then is the solution or an answer? Do we have a choice? Well, is it not logical to take matters in our own hands and guide our lives in the most intelligent manner? We as humans have been gifted with the capacity to think and act. Should we not think intelligently and then act accordingly? Should we not take a path which gives us the least amount of pain and misery, 
least amount of suffering and heartbreaks and that too in the least amount of time? Since man is the only species that has an advanced capacity to think and act, man needs, man needs to have an intelligent solution. And the intelligent solution calls for an intelligent way of living. Well then, what is intelligent living? First of all, our whole attitude of life must change. Presently, majority of the people are living their life blindly. Everyone is living the life but without a clear direction or a proper understanding of the life's goal. We are just blindly copying what everyone else is doing. We now know that any amount of material wealth and power, fame and position is not taking us anywhere. Any amount of outward and physical living is not taking us where we want to go. On the contrary, it is taking us further away from our goal, making us sink deeper and deeper in the insignificant things of life, in the quagmire of possessions and power. We are wasting time and effort on the unimportant things of life. And yet, we keep on living exactly that type of life, day in, day out. The answer is that we need to go within and find out that path, that path which will help us reach our goal in the shortest time possible. As human beings, we have the unique capacity to think intelligently and to make intelligent decisions. We need to go within and start nurturing the divine seed within. We need to go for that which is permanent, not that which is impermanent. And nurturing means supplying the right kind of nourishment and environment in which to grow and blossom. If we genuinely believe, if we genuinely believe in and understand the oneness of life, if we feel that there is a divine spirit in all that exists, in minerals, plants, in animals and human beings, does it not call for respect for all forms of life? The same respect as we give to a divine being? If we truly feel this oneness of life, would we litter our temples and mosques and churches and all other places of worship with garbage? Or pollute them with feelings of disharmony, hatred and violence? Would we litter the plants and trees and the environment with all sorts of waste everywhere? Would we burn down forests and cut down trees in such a greedy and inhuman manner? Would we drive so many plants and birds and insects and animals to extinction? Would we kill animals 
to make some clothing or a fur coat for someone? Would we kill an elephant just to make some senseless use of its ivory tusks? Would we abuse or make wasteful use of natural resources of air, water, gas, and all other natural reserves and resources? Would we flood the seas and oceans with tons of plastics and garbage? Would we hurt, injure, and kill our own fellow human beings just because his religion or ideology is different from ours? Would we pollute the atmosphere with our negative emotions and thoughts of jealousy, hatred, violence, animosity, greed, envy, and all sorts of selfishness? We are basically destroying and killing our own environment and the very world we live in. Look at the freshwater situation in the world. So many major cities of the world are facing a very critical shortage of even drinking water today. Look at what is happening to our forests and mountains and seas. Intelligent living would mean living a life that has a meaning and purpose. A life that has a well-defined goal. A life that respects all forms of life. As I said, we are rushing around like mad from morning till night, a rat race to nowhere. Unfortunately, we live such a fast life in such a fast world that we do not have time to pause and think as to where is this all leading us to. Let us pause for a moment and think, who am I? What have I done the whole day and the whole month and the whole year? What have I achieved or gained? Where is this life leading to? Where am I going? Often we find our answers to these questions very shocking. Years and years pass by and we have very, very little to account for the years gone by. Members of the TS must think intelligently about the above questions and work out an intelligent way of living. A living that reflects the wisdom obtained from both science and religion. Live a life that moves away from the religious dogmas and rituals to a truly spiritual life. A living that truly reflects the unity and oneness of life. A living that makes life a joyous one and a living that takes one to perfection in the most intelligent and most meaningful manner. A life full of 
care and concern, respect and freedom, courtesy and consideration, kindness and compassion for all forms of life, absolutely all forms of life, and a wonderful coexistence in peace and harmony. Living a life that realizes and demonstrates the oneness of life and unity of all existence. Giving freedom to all forms of life and not enslaving them. This calls for Mother Earth and respect for all forms of life. In medical science, there is a term called Vision 2020, which is considered the perfect vision of the eyes. Ordinarily, most of us are either short-sighted or long-sighted and therefore we have glasses to correct that uh, anomaly. <coughs> but a person who has perfect vision can see near as well as far away objects equally well. So his vision is called vision 2020. That's a medical term. Well, this year is 2020. And this gives us a perfect opportunity to start having a perfect vision of our life and its purpose and then start living a life that takes us to that perfection. So, let us all take charge, take control of our life and make sincere and concrete efforts to live an intelligent life where we tread the path in joy and happiness, where we discover the world and the wonders of the oneness of life. Let us live a life in accordance with the divine laws of nature. Let us feel that oneness in unity and harmony. Let us all strive to make our lives meaningful and purposeful, a life that is of service to others, a life that is in harmony with the entire creation and a life that feels and reflects the oneness of all that exists. Thank you, Brother Narendra, for those insightful gems of wisdom that hopefully will allow us not merely to exist like headless chickens running the rat race, but rather to live intelligently. Now, before I introduce our next speaker, we will have to uh, clear the uh, stage for her PowerPoint presentation for uh, just a few seconds.
for our next speaker, I was given a very brief biographical sketch. And I have noticed that this is her custom. Even when we had the privilege of having her as a guest speaker in our Indo-Pacific Federation conference held last November in Manila, Philippines, it was also a brief and even terse biographical sketch. And I suspect that she does this so that we can immediately proceed to her uh, lecture and uh, listen to what she has to say and discern uh, the uh, gems of wisdom. And uh, maybe if uh, we also had the opportunity and observe her life, to emulate such life because our next speaker is a former international vice president of the Theosophical Society. She is currently the president of the Australian section of the society as well as the editor of Theosophy in Australia. She joined the society in 1971, after hearing a lecture given by the philosopher J. Krishnamurti. She is passionate about theosophy because of its potential to profoundly transform an individual when reflected upon deeply and practiced with heart and mind. So this morning, we shall have Linda Oliveira with the topic the uh, sublime symbology of the lotus. Brother Charlie Romero, Chairperson, my co-speaker, Brother Narendra Shah, President of the Indian Section, Brothers and Sisters. Good morning to you all. The theme of this convention, Nurturing the Divine Seed, is a timely reminder that we are all indeed divine in essence and that the seed of this transcendental nature is always present, ready to expand into our waking consciousness when the conditions are favorable. Once that seed has opened even a little it makes an indelible mark on the heart and mind so that we are never quite the same again. Indeed, that partial opening is a foretaste of the glory that awaits each and every human being, something so powerful and so sublime that it is never forgotten. We can learn much of consequence from the book of nature, including the trajectory of our spiritual destiny. The universal symbology of a seed growing into a plant is both powerful and profound. And if there are any gardeners here, no doubt you will relate to this. There is tremendous beauty in seeing a plant grow from a seed into a seedling and then eventually seeing it grow to its full potential. The lotus is one such plant and of course it is a very significant one in the Theosophical Society. HPB affirmed that since antiquity, 
the lotus has been held sacred by the Aryan Hindus, Egyptians, Buddhists, and also adopted as a Christian emblem. In Christianity, the lotus is depicted as a lily. This flower has been revered in Japan and India and China, known as the Padma in India. It is a favorite simile, both for the cosmos itself and for the human being. So it has both cosmic and human implications. In the cosmic context, HPB explained that the lotus seed contains within itself the perfect miniature of the future plant, the spiritual prototype of all things hitherto existing in the immaterial world before they became materialized. We're going to consider now some properties of the lotus. First of all, some interesting information exists about the lotus flower, which can help to enrich this exploration a bit further. Long before the advent of humanity, lotus flowers were said to be distributed widely across the globe. When temperatures were low during the Ice Age, most plants in the Northern Hemisphere did not survive, and yet the lotus flower did so. These flowers have even been referred as living, referred to rather, as living fossil, fossils. And from these, we just derive a sense of that which is ancient and that which is precious. There's another correspondence too. There was a notable instance in 1954 in which lotus flowers disappeared in one area due to a catastrophic flood. However, remarkably, three years later, water receded, it backed down to normal levels, and in the shallow part of the lake concerned, the plants began to grow leaves again in great density. Two years later, an abundance of lotuses in that particular place returned. The lotus therefore has great tenacity in the face of natural disasters. Lotuses can endure scorching sun, but when dormant can even resist cold temperatures. So the lotus also symbolizes resilience in a very real sense. These natural qualities of the lotus flower are a thing that we humans can relate to. And of course, there is also tremendous beauty in a lotus flower. So beauty is another of its qualities. Let us now turn to the lotus as symbol of the universe. As mentioned before, it has cosmic implications. HPB wrote, this mysterious and sacred plant has been considered from time immemorial a symbol of the universe in Egypt as well as India. There is hardly a monument in the valley of the Nile, hardly a papyrus on and in which this plant did not have a place of honor. From the capitals of the Egyptian columns to the thrones and coiffures of the god kings, the lotus is found everywhere as a symbol of the universe. It became of necessity an indispensable attribute of every creative god and goddess. 
So you know, when we just look at a flower or just look at a lotus, we can see it at a physical level, but there is so much more to it, particularly with this flower. HPB continued that the conditioned cosmos came from Padma Yoni, the bosom of the lotus, from the absolute space of the universe outside of space and time. And so we read, the last vibration of the seventh eternity thrills through infinitude, the mother swells expanding from within without, like the bud of the lotus. The golden egg or matrix from which Brahma came forth was often referred to as the celestial lotus. Hence the flower is associated with the depiction of various deities. The god Vishnu, for example, floats in sleep during nights of Brahma on the primordial waters stretched on a lotus flower. The Hindu Trimurti is personified in the world of ideas by creation, preservation and destruction, or Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Interestingly, HPB stated that the lotus flower is used to symbolize this Trimurti because it is a flower that lives by earth, by water and by sun or fire. The lotus, which was sacred to Isis, had the same significance in Egypt. However, in Christianity, it was replaced by the water lily because the lotus flower was not found either in Judea or in Europe. Clearly, the lotus flower has a profound association with all that is sacred. Let us turn now to the lotus in ancient Egypt, in Buddhism and in Hinduism. Each of these throws a, a different light on the lotus flower, uh, a little um, different subtlety of meaning. In ancient Egypt, first of all, there were two main types of lotuses, the white and the blue lotus. The blue variety being scientifically a water during the night time and therefore they associated the lotus with the cyclicity of rebirth and also with the sun. Clearly the cycle in nature of the lotus flower was extended and uh, understood symbolically in terms of wider cycles. Because the sun also, for example, has its own cycle appearing during the daytime and disappearing from view at night. In the tradition of Egypt, we find the lotus associated with resurrection. There's a lovely passage from the papyrus of Ani from the Egyptian Book of the Dead which I will share with you for a moment. This is almost a meditation in its own right. You might like to even close your eyes and listen to the words. As if I had slept a thousand years underwater, I wake into a new season. I am the blue lotus rising. I am the cup of dreams and memory opening. I, the thousand petaled flower. At dawn, the sun rises naked and new as a babe. I open the petal reflected perfectly in clear water. I am that lotus filled with light reflected in the world. I float, content within myself, one flower with a thousand petals, one life lived a thousand years without haste, one universe sparking a thousand stars, one God alive in a thousand people. 
I float among the days in peace, content, not part of the world. The world is all the parts of me. I open toward the light and lift myself to the gods on the perfume of prayer. I ask for nothing beyond myself. I own everything I need. I am content in the company of God, a prayer. In Buddhism, the lotus is associated with purity, with spiritual awakening and detachment. It is associated with the white tara. The flower is considered pure because it is able to emerge from murky waters and be perfectly clean. The fact that water can easily slide off its petals can be equated with detachment, and the opening petals can be equated with spiritual awakening. Not unsurprisingly, the lotus also symbolizes the awakening of the Lord Buddha. A reminder that all beings have the same potential to reach enlightenment. The lotus flower itself represents the stages on the spiritual path. And that is because a closed bud is regarded as synonymous with the beginning of the journey. When the flower is partly open, one is walking it, and a fully blooming flower signifies the end of the journey or enlightenment. So they are some of its qualities. The lotus can be found throughout Buddhist art and literature. One of its most important representations is in the Lotus Sutra. Lotus flowers also come in many different colors each one having a different meaning, as we shall see now. Beginning with the white lotus, it symbolizes Bodhi, the state of perfect mental purity and spiritual perfection, and the pacification of our nature, the ability ultimately to become peaceful, to know tranquility. It is the lotus found at the heart of the Gabatatu mandala, being the womb or embryo of the world. Lotus of Avalokiteshvara. Then we come to the blue lotus, the symbol of the victory of the spirit over the senses, of intelligence, of wisdom, and of knowledge always represented normally as a partially opened bud, unlike that picture there. Uh, normally the center is never seen. The pink lotus. This is the supreme lotus generally reserved for the highest deity. Sometimes confused with the white lotus, it is the lotus of the historical Buddha. Then we have the purple lotus. This is the mystic lotus, represented only in images belonging to a few esoteric sects. The flowers may be in full bloom and reveal their heart, or they may be in a bud. The eight petals normally represented in this particular purple lotus uh, are said to represent the noble eightfold path. So we can see how rich the lotus is with the various aspects of its symbology. It's, it's extraordinarily beautiful. It becomes clear also how appropriate White Lotus Day is for the Theosophical Society in remembrance of HPB, because a lotus of this color represents mental purity and spiritual perfection, and given the fact that, of course, she took Pancha Sila. Despite her personal imperfections, she was a spiritual giant. 
Now we turn to the Hindu tradition. As mentioned before, the term Padma is translated into English as lotus. And in Hinduism, it has various expressions. By reproducing from its own matrix, rather than from the soil, the lotus symbolizes spontaneous generation. It can use either seed dispersal or else its root system for reproduction. So it kind of regenerates itself. It grows in mud and yet it rises in immaculate So its evolution begins in the mire of samsara but it rises to full enlightenment and purity of which it is the quintessential symbol. Purity is one of the main associations with the lotus in the Buddhist tradition. The unsullied lotus arising from the depths of the waters and far from the shore is associated with the idea of purity but also with sattva, balance and harmony. It represents purity of mind but also purity of body and purity of speech. The closed lotus clearly symbolizes potential. Open, it symbolizes actualization. And furthermore, when water is splashed on a lotus leaf, it never remains but immediately slips off. In the same way, the dirt of worldliness never stains an enlightened being. Lakshmi is normally also depicted as seated on a lotus which represents the enlightened and pure mind already mentioned. Also flowers such as the lotus, the padma and the blue lily are generally seen to be in the hands of the images of goddesses, especially for example, Lakshmi and Bhumi Devi. The lotus is therefore one of the attributes or one of the accessories of such deities. Like Lakshmi, the goddess Saraswati is often depicted as seated on a white lotus, which symbolizes light, knowledge, and truth. Cosmically, the lotus in Vishnu's lower right hand represents the manifested universe, foldment of the human being. As has already been seen, it has quite a profound meaning. It really follows the whole trajectory of human development from the mire of the mud of the earthly realm all the way to a state of divinity. The flower grows up through the water with its roots in the mud, representing the material realm. The stalk which passes up through the water is related to existence in the astral world, and the lotus flowers themselves are found on thick stems. The flower eventually opens its heart to the air above, and it's emblematic of spiritual being. So this richly allegorical flower represents various qualities relating to the human journey of spiritual unfoldment. And they are listed here on the right. Purity of mind, calmness, serenity, sattva, spiritual perfection, knowledge, wisdom and love, compassion, passion, the highest deity, beauty, non-attachment, and enlightenment. Extremely rich. It is deeply uplifting to consider that within each of us dwells the jewel in the lotus, which can be thought of as Padmapani, Krishna, Buddha, divine potential. 
A couple of quotations now as this draws to a conclusion. Firstly from HPB, who wrote, enough has been said to show that while for the Orientalists and profane masses, the sentence om mani padmi hum means simply oh the jewel in the lotus. Esoterically, it signifies oh my God within me. Oh my God within me. Yes, there is a God in each human being, she said, for man was and will re-become God. Or we may think of it this way, that we are divine and we will re-become or re-embrace that divinity. So she spoke about the indissoluble union between man or the human being and the universe. And the lotus, the universal symbol of the cosmos as the absolute totality with the jewel being spiritual man or God. So the jewel in the lotus, Om Mani Padmi Hom, O Chanel, imbued with very deep meaning. For the cycle of the lotus holds allegorically the potential of universes and the potential of the self-realized human being. We'll finish now with some lovely words from the Lotus Sutra. He who perceives the world with truth, purity and vast knowledge and with benevolence and compassion should be ever longed for and looked up to. He is a spotless pure ray of light a sun of wisdom that destroys the darkness, a flame that withstands the winds of calamity, he brilliantly illuminates the entire world. Thank you, Linda, for highlighting and underscoring another facet of the lotus. And uh, henceforth, we could start with the lotus found on the fountain beside the Indian section's headquarters and look at it in its sublime significance. So in behalf of our brothers and sisters, we thank Narendra and Linda for sharing their lectures this morning and uh, to our brothers and sisters in the audience, thank you for your kind attention. This morning's session is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>